Hello. Hey, everyone. Give me a second. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the API Days India. This is very first time we are doing this, and we are super excited to have you all. So uh, this is the second stage of technical stage where we are going to speak a lot about the connected stack around the APIs and the digital strategy and API strategy, right? And uh, yeah, so our very first speaker is the Matt, who is going who is going to talk a lot about the reason of why API fails. The very uh, near example we had a uh, face for the API API failure uh, when the vaccination portal was not sending us an OTP. So the, the user behavior we saw and uh, why it's really important to think about API failure and how we can make it make sure that we, our API will not fail. Matt, please welcome and stage is all yours. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate that. All right, let's let's kick off three reasons why APIs fail. Now, to give a slight bit of context, we're trying to look at the high level of what you need to look at as you're moving into a more API-driven environment. So it's not going to be too technical. Don't get scared, and you're welcome to ask all the questions. In the end, I always like to get challenged, and uh, if you can make me trip up and find a question I can't answer, I will happily take on that challenge. Now let's. See if you can get that slide moving. There we go. Hi, I'm Matt. Now, you might have noticed with the ginger beard and with, you know, the face and the accent, I, I wasn't born in India and I wasn't born in Singapore, which is where I'm based. I'm originally from Europe and I've been moving around um, the world quite a bit to help businesses innovate and, and become more digitally fluent. Now, I'm working for New Relic and I've, I've been focused on India, which is uh, going through an exciting transformation. Um, but I've also done a similar thing in Europe for Pony Relic previously, and in between did a short stint on the short stint on focusing on moving traditional broadcasters into the cloud. So I've worked with a lot of newspapers across India and a lot of the newer OTT apps. So that's kind of my background where I'm coming from. And so what we're looking at today are really three core areas, right? We're kind of going from that first step of that, that monolith, that big service, and breaking that down into more of a microservices environment. So that first, first jump of how do you actually go from having one app to having loads of small apps that you suddenly need to take care of. Then we're actually jumping into the three reasons why APIs fail. Now, I like to call this the finger pointing section where you get teams saying, actually, I think this might be your fault. Um, I, I feel like um, I've been educated on not using finger pointing because that's not the business friendly term. I think it's called um, ineffective collaboration. But we're looking at what are some of the common themes that happen as APIs fail and how can you actually make sure that you're not affected by this and you have more productive and effective communication and collaboration. And then lastly, I'm open for questions. Um, you'll get my email address as well. You're more than welcome to ask away and ask ask questions, uh, put them in the chat, and I think Shreya will, will call them out as well. So we've got some time allocated for questions. So before we jump into the three reasons, or three of the main reasons why APIs fail, let's go through a short short history of where APIs have come from um, and what journey have they gone through. And Salesforce, <laughs> it looks really different today, but Salesforce was one of the first services that had an XML API, and it was really about getting information um, getting information out. So when we're thinking about what APIs do, they really connect two services that are usually disconnected and they're transforming or they're passing on information. And so one of the first APIs that was publicly available was Salesforce API. And then shortly after followed by Amazon and both of them had an XML API, right? So it was really the kind of API that would be called for you know, one-way communication. It would be a feed, news feeds were coming out around that time as well to pass information from one service to another is static. And as time went on, different services started adopting APIs for other use cases. Flickr um, is, is renowned for being an early adopter of technology and having a REST API, which was big at the time. 
and just a change of how things were progressed. And then it allowed other tools to integrate with Flickr. So you didn't have to go to that web interface to upload pictures, but you could build apps, you could build connectors, your blog could upload a picture directly to Flickr. And that was big, that was massive at the time. But again, all of those were sort of public APIs to integrate into different tools. And a lot of the time behind the scene, we still had a monolith that was powering. And then Twitter had a really different use case for an API. The Twitter API was actually just built out to keep people from scraping Twitter. So a lot of the time, you know, the, what Twitter noticed is that bots would access the website, just scrape the information, and then pass it into a third-party system. And so another use case for API that kind of came out early on was to control the flow of information, to keep, you know, systems from going down by being able to easily allow access to information and make sure that it's accessed in the way that well, the product is really intended to be used. Now, that was really a quick history of how APIs progressed throughout different companies and different, different technology vendors. But if you look at the technology behind it, we see a lot of buzzwords. And some of them you'll recognize straight away, and some of them you might not have heard. They all are used for different use cases. And so you see that they've come out consistently and reliably, reliably and they will, you know, there'll be new buzzwords coming out every year. But the key focus here really is understanding what you're trying to achieve with your API. What is it that you're doing? Is it an app that is just in your own backend services that is, is communicating with another app in your backend service and that needs to exchange small pieces of information on a high frequency? Or is it a one-off, like a feed poll, where you maybe download a news feed once a day and then you'll, you'll pull it again tomorrow? Or like a you know, podcast still uses a feed in the, in the back end and they don't get pulled as often because they don't get released as often. So what's the use case for the API? Now, this is about just to set that expectation as well. This is about as technical as it gets, right? We're kind of going, we're going a step back in terms of the technical and really looking at how APIs shape the world that we that we use. Now, one little addition that I want to make here is to differentiate between a microservice and, and an API. So a microservice is a small piece of software that does a very specific job. And the API is really that outer layer that connects it to other microservices or to you know, a monolith. So an API, in essence, is really just the interface, how we interact with other tools. Um, and then microservices just means that we'll have more APIs that need to interact with each other because every single piece in that, in that ecosystem needs to pass information onto, onto, a, different, onto a different service. All right, so let's kick off and go into the three reasons why APIs fail and how you can take charge and stay in control. Now, unable to scale to meet demands. I feel like this is kind of to Atreya's, to, to Atreya's point, which she said about not, you know, an, an OTP service, a uh, service that just sends out a text confirmation, not being able to meet the demand of people trying to get an appointment for vaccinations. If you've read the news over the past day, you might have noticed that, you know, crypto prices plummeted. And as a result, well, usage really went up of these services. People are trying to quickly sell off some assets and every big exchange had an issue at some point or another. And when you really look at the details of where they failed, oftentimes they failed with the lock-in service. So people just weren't able to get into the account, never mind trade, but that first step where people authenticate was the bit that was broken. Now, if you're unable to scale for demand, you're really not, you know, you're not providing a great user experience, but you're also not able to take on that business that you otherwise would be able to take on. If I told you just 12 months ago, well, if I told you two years ago, time is flying. If I told you two years ago, you know what, for the next two years, we're going to be at home an awful lot. You may be in a lockdown. You probably don't want to leave your house because it's unsafe. Restaurants are probably closed, but you can still you can take away orders. You can just order food on an app and then you're staying at home you're trying to avoid people and you're getting your food delivered at home. I would have given you a faint smile and probably walked away um, because that was in, that was a world that I couldn't imagine. And, and fast forward 12 months, that's where we are. So put this in a different context, my gran, who's not the youngest, can now order food on her phone, not, not by calling the place. She has an app on her phone and she knows how to use it. My, my gran a couple of years ago couldn't even use use a phone, um, never mind, well, 
a smartphone, never mind, you know, all the food. At this point of the year of living at home and not leaving the house, my gran is able to order food on her phone, have it delivered and avoid social contact. And that's, to me, a great example of how times have just changed. So if you don't know how to scale for demands, if you don't understand which part of your architecture needs to grow really quickly as volume goes up, as you know, as, as requests go up, as you need to accommodate a piece of news, like saying a, a new lockdown that has been announced, you need to understand which part of the application has really hit the hardest. So for that example of exchanges of cryptocurrencies going down, well, if you can't log in, everything else in that food chain of services of APIs that is ready to go and perform it doesn't matter because people don't actually get to that part. Now, as you grow as a business, and as you scale up, that's going to get a lot more complex, right? And so if you start out and you just have five microservices to, to look after and you've got a small set of instances, this is also relatively easy. You can get it onto a single screen. You can kind of focus on, you know, the couple of boxes where you notice some inconsistencies, but that's not a scalable, that's not a scalable measure. So once you go up and you have massive amounts of instances, massive amounts of applications that might be auto scaling and that might be struggling for different reasons, you need to get a good understanding of which part of the application you need to look at and what you need to do to fix it. So knowing when something happens. And that's really linked to the second reason that APIs often fail. You have too much complexity too quickly. Um, I, I spoke at API Day Singapore about a month ago, and just before me, I had a developer um, present and, and it was one of the most interesting talks because it was what I was saying, but from a developer's perspective, he's in the nitty gritty day to day. And one of the challenges that was presented is having inconsistent uh, inconsistent rules for APIs used across the company. So if you have multiple teams that are breaking down different services that are, you know, trying to mod modernize different parts of the application and you don't apply the same design principles, you're going to bump into new issues, different errors, wherever you go. So if you fix an error in one part of the application, one API, that doesn't necessarily apply to the other part of the application. So it's really crucial that as your complexity grows, as your company grows, as your product grows, as you scale because you are successful, you understand what's happening, where it's happening, and how to fix it. And once you've done it in one place, ideally apply those learnings to your other services. Now, again, this is the same, this is the same idea, right? You're going from a number of microservices that fit onto your screen easily, and then suddenly you've just doubled or tripled your workloads. That's a challenge, and that's a challenge that's really hard to overcome. So to do that, you need to make sure that you understand how your services are connected, where in that long stream of microservices or um, APIs you might have an issue, and they might be internal APIs that you can control, and that's really great. But sometimes you don't have any control over them. So say a payment gateway, to Shreya's example, say uh, an SMS gateway, right? a texting service that you're using to send all oh, those OTPs. It might not have been the API that failed. It might have been that gateway that failed. And so it's knowing which part actually fails, being able to contract, contact that vendor, for example, that SMS gateway and saying, look, we've noticed there's an issue with delivering these text messages. Can you have a look? Because it's really important that as people are booking their vaccination appointments, they actually get a confirmation in text. <laughs> and lastly, if you know that it is your service, also being able to go back and, uh, excuse me one second there. Quite positive, this is not COVID, it's just a regular cough because I'm right under the AC. At least that's what I hope. All right, apologies for that. But understanding where in your application stack you need to look and how to fix it is crucial. So oh, going one step further. There we go. And that really comes with understanding who's in charge of the APIs. So accountability is a massive, massive topic as you're looking at as you're looking at your infrastructure and as it grows. Who's in charge of looking at an issue when your service goes down at 2 a.m. in the morning? Which team gets contacted? Who gets the alert? Is it all your teams? Is it one of your teams is it somebody who then gets to triage at 2 a.m. and then tries to wake up all the other people? It's understanding who's accountable. And so what are you really doing is you're going from that simple view of just understanding 
and maybe I should have spoken to this slightly more, but what this what the screen is displaying is a box for each of your applications, right? And so some of the applications uh, in this example application are doing really fine, and some of the apps are potentially having some issues. But this doesn't really tell you who's in charge and you should look at it. It just tells you which application is currently experiencing issues. So as you're growing and as you're modernizing, it's really crucial to go that extra step and then understand who to contact when something goes wrong. So what we're seeing in this screen is very, very similar in that we see all the different services that are being used. We see that some internal, just going over, some internal services that are monitored with, in this case, New Relic, but it could be any monitoring service. Um, but then some external ones as well, like a billing service, a credit card service, right? So these you don't necessarily have control over, but you still have a stakeholder that needs to understand what to do when it goes down, who to contact, what you know SLAs haven't been met, and what to do to inform customers or also internal stakeholders that there's going to be an issue for the next while. So how do you make sure you get proper alerts and you get the, the alert to the right person? Well, it's really grouping your application in ways that make sense to you. So this could be a workload, for example, if, you, if you've got a DevOps, DevOps culture in your, in your company, in your dev teams, right, where you have the infrastructure person and the developer and, and maybe the front end person for, say, the login service in a, in a pod, and they can then easily jump in and say, okay, well, the infrastructure is doing fine, the front end is doing fine, the back end has been throwing some errors, so that's what we need to look at and that's what we need to resolve. So what is it that the other two can do to help out in that in that short term, right? So for example, the front end should probably display a message saying, you might bump into an issue, but we're working on that. And then the back end person can solve that. But it's grouping your services in ways that make sense to you. What we don't want to happen is that you get an error just over here and then obviously that next service will get impacted and that next service will get impacted and then this service will get impacted and suddenly the front end will get impacted and so within seconds you might have four teams alerted because one api failed very early on in the food chain it's understanding how your services are connected and making sure you get the right people on the job straight away to make sure you get to resolve to resolving that uh, quickly as well All right, so once you have that alignment, what you will get is a view, or what you can get is a view of, again, all those core metrics and moving away from sort of the high level view that you know you might look at on a TV screen where you just see there's an issue, we should probably look at that and diving into the detail. And that's the other bit that's really important as you're making your infrastructure more complex and you can scale individual components like a login service, um, you know, faster than you might need to scale some of the other components. And that's really one of the benefits of working with APIs is making sure that you can individually scale your services as they need it. But going from a high level view of oh, something's wrong there to the detailed view, seeing a graph, getting a timeline of what happened, which, you know, which part of that login service got tripped up. Was it a database issue? Was it a proxy issue? Was it a uh, a low balance issue, where do you actually need to look at and what do you need to do to fix it in the very short term, but then also in the long term, because you don't want that issue to happen again. Now, I'm saying this with a faint smile, because if you look, uh, if you look at previous, you know, crashes of crypto prices or sudden price spikes, there's always been a slew of exchanges going down. But that's the other thing that you really need to be very, very aware of is what are you trying to fix? Are you trying to make sure you have perfect uptime? Are you trying to avoid downtime? And then if you're trying to avoid downtime, is it because you're meeting SLAs? Is it because you have you know, legal obligations? So for example, with financial markets, I wouldn't be surprised if there were, you know, if there were an introduction of laws that require you to have a certain uptime as prices start to, start to change more drastically. And so it's always good to understand what you're trying to solve, do it with purpose, understand who it is that needs to look at a potential issue, and then lastly, be aware of growing with purpose and scale that you can actually control. So have good design principles, make sure that your teams are collaborating across your organization and you have a good structure of how you're developing your apps and you can then apply learnings across the team to, you know, two different, different, uh, different teams as well. And on that point, 
Let me introduce Jason, who works with me. He's also based in Singapore. And just after this call, maybe about 20 minutes after the session, he's doing a workshop on understanding what's wrong with your APIs. So while well, this was a really high level overview of what you should be aware of, this workshop dives into a bit more of the nitty gritty of as a developer, what do I need to be aware of? Where do I need to be focused? Where do I need to put my energy? So if you haven't signed up, I'd recommend it. Um, it's going to be interactive. So bring your bring your energy, bring a cup of coffee, bring a cup of chai along and then get cracking and help help Jason make this an interactive session. And I think we've got about four minutes left if my <laughs> if my timing isn't off. So if there's any questions, I think this is where Trey is going to pop back in and challenge me. <laughs> Okay, Matt, uh, thank you very much for sharing the three reasons. It was really interesting. And uh, API failure is one of the key points that every organization has to focus uh, to solve the customer better and uh, to be there at each point of time. Yeah, so uh, we have some questions, uh, and I would love to uh, start a question by asking uh, any real life uh, API failure story that you have heard or you might experience by yourself? Um, well, so the, the most recent one was not being able to log into exchanges yesterday. So um, if you look at if you look at just the bloodbath of, of say financial markets in the past day and people trying to sell off assets just before they hit you know rock bottom, that was a, that was a great use case. And if you're on Reddit or any or Twitter or any of the social media websites, there's a lot of backlash. One that's slightly funnier is um, when I was working for OTT streaming services, uh, you know, most of them had gone cloud native, everything was hosted in the cloud, except for one small component that was in an on-prem data center right next to a shopping mall. And there was a fire in that shopping mall. They had to cut the electricity for that data center and the entire OTT, the entire streaming service went down. So, you know, APIs can be really crucial. And if one of the APIs fails, the entire application can go down. So it's being aware of as you're moving into an API space, as you're integrating different services, what happens if they don't work? And what happens if the ones that you can't control stop working on you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing. So we have uh, one of the questions uh, from this Eric. He's asking that how can complexity handled if the API design is deviating from target architecture? So how, I think my my cut off for a second. My question: How can the API? How can how can complexity handles if the API design is deviating from targeted architecture? So, so sorry, is it possible to give a brief uh, about your question? So as your so so as, as, as if I understand the question correctly, it's if your API is getting more complex. Um, how can you keep up with design principles to, to match the complexity? Um, I think is how I understood it. If I got that wrong, you've got my email address pop up on the on the slide and tray. I will pull it back in at the very end. Um, but I would say complexity is often the sheer number of APIs. So it's not as much the inner workings, right? Because obviously you're trying to simplify your individual components of your application by breaking it down into components. So complexity is often how they work with each other. And it's really crucial that you have a consistency across your services. Um, so some of my customers use different messaging protocols between APIs, and that's caused friction because they can't monitor some of them. They, they don't know how fast it is to how fast communication is happening between APIs. And that can make a big difference if you have a single request hitting multiple points and the communication between APIs is slow. That can be a challenge. But yeah, the complexity is really more about how many services you have. Um, and then monitoring becomes incredibly important because you want to get an overview of what's happening across all your different microservices and if any of them is slowing down your overall application. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much, Matt, for joining us today. It was a great session. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. Um, and I, because I promised it, if you can pull up my, my screen for just one more second, I've got the email address there so people can snap a quick picture of it. And there you go. So if your question wasn't answered or if I didn't get your question right, drop me an email and I'm happy to jump onto a call with you as well. Have an awesome yeah. day and thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Bye. Yeah. Bye.